Hello, welcome back to statistical analysis uh, for week three. Uh, today, we're going to talk about exploratory data analysis. In particular, we're looking at how you're going to describe your data. With me again, Dr. Yandu Chandra at the City University of Hong Kong. So for, for various reasons, before we do a uh, serious type of statistical analysis, we should, all, we should know the type of data that we have, right? We need to know um, why statistics are useful. So if you have been following from the previous other videos in this course, you have learned that statistics is so useful for us because it helps us summarize the data, the information about the world in a single number. Remember when, we, when I talked about the probability of raining, when you watch the weather forecast in the television, it's a probability, so they just use a number, 60% chance of rain. Or people who are going to see a doctor to see what's the probability of getting pregnant, or what are the probability of achieving success. Um, so, so statistic is so useful because it gives us those single numbers. And because of the numbers, it, it makes our life easier because we can describe the reality in a very efficient manner. Now, in this week's uh, topic, we're going to look at descriptive statistics. We call it descriptive statistics because it is by nature descriptive. It only tells us what is very obvious that we can uh, examine or we can look at uh, from the output. For example, you can do frequency analysis, like you're doing the basic counting and the percentages of the things that you're calculating. We're going to talk about mean or average value, the median or the middle value, the mode or the most frequently appearing value. And we're also going to talk about the spread of the data, such as the standard deviation, how far is your data spreading from the mean value and variance, <clears throat> another form of vari uh, how the data spread from the, from the mean and the two variance and standard deviations are like a brothers and sisters. <coughs> We're going to look at it in a moment. And then correlation, which is perhaps the most uh, important of the most commonly used type of descriptive statistics to show the relationship between two or more variables, typically continuous or metric type of variables. And also we're going to look at pi square, in which we could look at very similar with correlation, but it is more used for variables that are measured using nominal or categorical type of scale. Um, um, just, just to give you a bit of a picture for some of you who have previously work in consulting firms or even in large companies or in research companies in any research type of role, you would quickly notice that a lot of the businesses, um, when they analyze their data, they stopped at doing descriptive analysis. So this is the looking at only the mean or the median and standard deviation, but they really go beyond that. Of course, in recent years, we have seen there's a lot more interest on uh, data science, computational social sciences, and we start to see uh, a lot more interest in how we could push this further, right? So, so the courses that you learn in this course will help you prepare for data science and other type of courses. So the first type of descriptive statistics is just very simple counts and percentages, right? When we talk about counts and percentages, these are just very easy and simple uh, to understand kind of uh, statistics that you can tell to your to your audience, right? For example, uh, you can have, like in this example, uh, it shows that how many people are male or female in your sample or how many are in a certain type of variables. For example, the other variable that is called minority classification. So, so in, in some countries when they do research, they always ask people about their, their ethnic uh, background and things like that. And they, they can calculate whether this type of people are minority or not. So it just gives you 
a very simple count and percentages. Counts are the exact number of, let's say, how many male, how many female are in your survey. And then you have a percentage column. Right? And when you add up, if your data is correct, it should total up to 100%. And then it can show you uh, the cumulative percentages. So, so these are very simple type. And when you uh, are producing your uh, uh, descriptive statistics, one of the most common output that you will you will see coming out of your SPSS uh, using example using SPSS also. Although later we're going to show you how to use R as well. If you look at your output from your SPSS software, you can see whether your data is normally distributed or not. Certainly you want your data to be normally distributed. And that is related from uh, the videos from uh, the previous uh, week. So have a look at those uh, previous week's video. So what does a normal distribution, normally distributed data look like? It should, it should be looking at the one on the left, the one that says normal, right? The one that looks more like a bell curve, right? Although it, it, it's not perfectly in a bell curve symmetrical shape. But the one on the my right, that says non-normal, that, that shows something is really not right, right? So it, it skews a lot to one side. So, so you need to do something about this when your data is having this type of issue. So that pattern is called skewness, right? So what you just saw just now, which is that one, that one on the screen on the on the right hand side. So it's called it's a positive skew. So it's, it goes to one side, right? Um, so in a positive skew, your mean value is always higher than your median and your mode value. But in a perfect, uh, this perfectly distributed data, or what we call having a symmetrical distribution, the one in the middle, your mean, your median, and your mode are all well aligned in the same position. Right? So that's why it looks so perfect. But your data could also skew, neg have a negative skew in which your median value has, is much, has a smaller value than your median and smaller than the mode. So any data can always, you know, in, in any of this position. So uh, for example, uh, and there will be some numbers that you can calculate. Actually, you don't have to calculate this by hand, but if you're using SPSS, for example, uh, one of your descriptive statistics table, if you click it in the function, it will give you the skewness and also courtesies later. So for example, the skewness has some number, right? And the skewness has a certain number, but if you look at the different value of the skewness, two or minus one, that looks very positively skewed or very negatively skewed, but you look at the one on the most right, the value is kind of closer to the value of zero. So, so when, when your skewness is closer to zero, then you are more likely to have more symmetrical uh, type of distribution. Okay. The next one is called courtesies. Still uh, on the same page in your descriptive results from your SPSS, it will give you a number called courtesies. So courtesies tells you how heavily uh, the tail of your distribution is from the tail of a normal distribution, right? So it, it, it gives you the, uh, the idea of how sharp it is or how flat it is, your, your data, when, when you put it in a, in, a, in a graphical plot, right? So a, a, a typical, let's say, a, a normally distributed data would have what we call mesocritic, the one in the middle. Right, mesocritic. So the tail, the, the tail is on this side. So this is the top, this is the top, and this is the tail. So the tail of the perfectly distributed data or mesocritic, the tail should not be too thick or too thin. It should be kind of medium, right? Uh, it's approximately has a value of three. Uh, we can talk about that later. Where does that number come from? But it has that shape. But some data of the variables that you have collected via, the, via, uh, via survey or via experimental forms uh, may, may, may be very sharp that we call liptokurtic in which the value the value is more than three. It can be very flat, the one, the green one at the bottom, 
right? So, so this is just to show uh, you graphically and very quickly how your data looks like. And, and, and this is uh, uh, very useful. Now, let's go jump into uh, the very important part of descriptive analysis. Frequency analysis that we have talked earlier on the counts and percentages are, are commonly used. But the key part about descriptive statistics, when people talk about descriptive statistics, is you always talk about mean or the average value, right? So the means or the average value uh, is the average. <laughs> the average means uh, the value of every observation divided by the total number of the uh, the observation. So for example, you measure a variable A, let's say A is um, uh, uh, the GPA score of university students, right? And you have uh, seven respondents, which is extremely, extremely small. And of course we should not use this, but this is just to show you uh, visually how these means can be calculated. So let's say you have seven students um, who have a score of three, four, six, six, eight, nine, eleven. Uh, well, let's not, let's not use this GPA. Let's use something else. Let's say, um, like, how, how many glasses of water uh, does a person drink in a day, right? And each of the persons say, uh, some say three, four, six. So mean value is just an addition of each of these from you add three, four, six, six, eight, nine, eleven, and divided by the number of the observation. How many observations do you have? Three, four, six, six, eight, nine, eleven. So you have seven counts, right? So then so you add up, you have 47 divided by seven, it gives you 6.7. So the, the mean value or the average score for this is called 6.7. So when you produce this in SPSS, you don't need to do the calculation by hand. You, 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 if you want to do the calculation by hand, that is the formula the one with the under the circle, right? So what it is saying is you, you, you add up, you add up each observation xi from the first one until how many ones that you have divided by how many ones in total that you have. Let's say if you have seven of them divided by seven and that gives you the x bar. x bar is the average value. Uh, if, you wanted to, if you want to know how to calculate mean value in Excel, have a look at that very nice YouTube uh, link that I provided below. So SPSS will give you the mean value. You can also calculate by hand if you want. The second is called median value. Median is just the middle score of a distribution of scores of, of or observations. So how you how do you make how do you calculate median is you arrange your number in a sequential order, and you look at the one right in the middle. Let's say again, you have a variable called B you measure this B on seven people. Let's say how many glasses of water that you drink in a day. The person say, the first person say, I drink three glasses and the second person say four glasses and the seventh person say 10 glasses, right? So in, 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 in calculating median, you, you, you can't just, uh, you can't just calculate the median value by looking at whatever is presented to you. So you, you need to rearrange that in a sequential order. So start with the smallest number to the biggest number. Okay? So you start from whatever you have there, two is the smallest and 11 is the biggest. So you arrange that and you find the one right in the middle, right? So two, three, four, 11, 10, nine, that's three each. And five is right perfectly in the middle. So the median value for these seven observations is five, right? So, but what happens when your observations uh, are not in an odd uh, uh, frequency? For example, you have a score, you have a, a bunch of scores that have one, two, two, four, five, seven. This one, I have rearranged them in sequential order, right? So how do you calculate how do you calculate the median? Very simple. You just go to the right in the middle and sometimes you need to do the division, right? So one, two, seven, five. So you have two and four in the middle. So two and four, you take the middle value. So two plus four divided by two because there are two, two of this number. Two plus four divided by two give you a number of three. So the median value, the median value really depends on how, how large is your observations, right? 
Um, and when you do the descriptive, uh, descriptive statistics, the SPSS will provide you the median value automatically. However, you can always calculate it if you like uh, using Excel as shown in the YouTube link provided below. Very easy, right? Okay. So median and mean. So as I mentioned earlier on, when the median and mean and the mode are perfectly the same number, you have the one in the middle called normal distributions. It's perfectly distributed. But sometimes your mean can be small, have a smaller value than your median than your mode. Let's say, let's say um, the mean value is five. You could have a median value of six and mode could be 6.5. So, and the positive skew is the other side of it, for example, in which uh, the mean value is much higher than the median and the mode. So don't worry too much about this at this moment, but it's just to show you that in every variable that you are measuring, either you're using a survey or experimental type of, 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 of research, your data sometimes are not, or oftentimes are not perfectly distributed. And it's good that you understand how your data looks like. Now, the, the third most popular use uh, of descriptive statistics is called mode. So mode is a score or value that appears most often, most often. So if you like going uh, to a casino and play the roulette, the roulette, you know, or the, the, the number, big or small, or some people are so, Having really having nothing to do, so they sit near the street and counting for the cars that pass by and look at their plate number, whether it's odd or even. <laughs> so that is looking at the mode, looking at which one appears the most, right? So let's say you also do a survey and you, you, you're measuring a variable called D. So again, drinking of water as a variable D. How many glasses of water do you drink per day? And you got this number um, in calculating mode, you just need to look at which one appears the most frequently. Right? And the one that you can see over there is so obviously the score number nine. It appears how many times? Four times, right? Six, three, nine, second one, and then another nine, and another nine, two nine. So they're four times. So, so the mode is nine, right? And again, you don't have to calculate this by hand. This will spit out by SPSS or R for you if you call out that command. You can also calculate it using Excel and you can watch the YouTube link below. So that's mode. Um, typically people talk about mean, median and mode, right? But there are some other important information that we should also uh, know when we talk about this uh, very simple type of descriptive statistics. And these are the kind of statistics that people always use. People talk about, in a university, you have semesters, right? When you say a year is 12 months, right? When you say semester, semester is two. So you divide the year into two. So semester one, semester two, right? So that is how you divide an, a, a, a huge amount of number into just two portion, right? You can also divide the year into quarters. Now, a lot of companies, when they report their earnings or their income, their profits, they have it in what they call quarterly earnings or quarterly calls with the analyst or with a journalist. So that means uh, Q1, for example, in Q1, which is from January till March, the, the, the company will talk, release to the media and talk to the journalist about the performance of the company. And they also have Q2. So Q2 is the next three months, so up till June. Right? And then you have Q3, which is from July till, let's say, September. right? And you have Q4, which is around October till December. So in a year, you can also split this into four quarters. So quart quarter means when you have a lot of data, you chop it out across four sections, across four very precise sections. Let's go quarter. Sometimes the number for the quartile may not perfectly fit in the number that you have, and you need to find a way to know uh, where exactly it is, right? And this style is you divide your data into 10, every, every 10, 10 pieces, right? And 
uh, so when you look at the relationship between the quartile, decile, and percentile, percentile is, of course, percent means per 100. Let's go percentile, right? Per 100. Per 100 means you divide up your data in terms of every 100, right? So, for example, when you have this, uh, your data, when you say quartile, you may divide it into one, two, and three, and four, right? Over the, of course, over there is typically shown as one and three. I mean, this is referring to the box plot. Box plot always show one to three. And you have a decile, actually one to 10, but here it's shown as one to nine. And you have a percentile, which is uh, from zero to 100, which is only shown here up to 90. But when you look at the relationship, quartile is zero to 25%, that's called first quartile. And the second quartile is from 25% to 50%, right? And then the third quartile is from 50 to 75%, and the fourth quartile is 75% to 100%. So where does the mean value lies in? Mean value is exactly that 50% value on the box below. So second quartile, the end of second quartile, and the beginning of the third quartile, so that point called 50%, that is called the median. So you can also map it out on, among, along the decile and the percentile. So when you say the 10th decile, this is between 90th to 100%. The first decile is from zero to 10%. So this is just to give you uh, a different uh, sort of variation in terms of descriptive statistics. Now, this is also a very, very useful type of descriptive statistics it's called box plot. So box plot is a way to quantitatively show your data plots in a rectangle shape. Uh, in a rectangle shape so that you can show your first, second, and third quarter. Remember, uh, so I showed you early on, we said there's, there, are, there are four quarter, but normally you show it in three quarter in a box plot. And the median the median part, or called the second quartile, is the median value. The median value. So some researchers likes to plot their data uh, in a, in a horizontal uh, format, right? So you have a median, and then you have a, a first quartile Q1 and Q2, the third quartile. But uh, most of the publications of research that people do is actually the one the one on the left, in which is a vertical version. This is actually easier to see. When you have a lot of plots, you can compare and it's a lot easier to do them. So what you can see there is Q1, Q1 is the, the that's uh, rectangle shape. Q1 is the bottom of the shape, which is the first percentile. And Q2 is the 75th percentile. And median is actually right in the middle. So even when you chop, when you chop that uh, rectangle right in the middle, that's your median point or median value. And then you have the two legs. Two long legs. Imagine this is look like a car that you look at it from the top. So the car here, and it has a very long wheel on the on the left, on the right, right? So the 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 long legs there is the maximum and the minimum value. So it's the range. You can see. So some of the data may have a, a let's say how many glasses of water do you drink? And you survey 100 people. Maybe some people say, I only drink two glasses of water. So that might be, let's say, the minimum. Uh, number of glass of water that people drink. So you may have one or two dots or, or, or humans who score at that area. And you may have some people who say, I drink 50 glasses of water a day. And that, let's say, let's say these are the people who drink the most in your sample. And you see some people who are there. Maybe you have, you have, you have in your survey out of 100 people, some people say they have drunk 500 glasses of water. Well, is that possible? I don't know. How, how big is your glass? Uh, let's say if you're common glass, it, it, it sounds a little bit impossible if one person drink like 500 glasses in the day. And, and this could actually be outliers, right? So they could be beyond the maximum value. Or you say, how many glasses of water do you drink in a day? And some people say zero. <laughs> that might even be lower than the minimum value. That could be another type of outlier. So we always have to pay attention to this outlier value. Because remember, the assumptions of statistics that we are learning in this course, as well as most of the statistics is called the frequentist tradition of statistics in which uh, we cannot be disturbed by the outlier or extreme values. The outliers are extreme values, extremely high or extremely low. So in, in a frequentist, frequentist 
traditional statistics, we want our data more or less normally distributed. And if not so perfectly distributed, there are some adjustments that you can make to your data so that your analysis will produce something that makes sense. So, so that's how it looks like. Uh, pay attention to your uh, outliers and maximum minimum and your median and the first percentile and the third uh, percentile. Now, this is one example of uh, a research by some scientists that they look at the temperature of the water. The one, if you look at the one at the bottom, the temperature of the water and the station ID. So you can see that these scientists are trying to measure the temperature of the water in degrees Celsius on the y-axis and the station. So they have three stations and they measure the temperature of the water in daytime and in nighttime. So three stations have six measurements daytime, nighttime for first station and the second station and the third, session, third uh, station. And they also show different type of uh, months, different months in the year and the content uh, in the water, such as chloride, blah, 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 and also phosphorus and other things. So they just want to show the, the, the different components of chemicals in the water across the year, right? So. So these are the vertical type of the box plot, and this is used a lot. So you can see, for example, some of the dots there, these are the outlying values, the extreme values, either extremely low, extremely, uh, extremely low or extremely high. So you have to pay attention to this. Let's say I present this to you, right? So let's say you are uh, the director of a big company and you have a lot of salesperson, right? And from someone who names Andrew, Jill, until Sorvino and Thompson, right? And we also plot on the left, on the y-axis, the, their revenue, how much sales that they can generate, right? And you can have each person that shows in the bar, right? Look at the leg, the maximum <clears throat> and the minimum amount of sales or revenue that they generate from their, from their work. And the box, the rectangle, right? The third quartile and the first quartile and the median value, the, the, the number in the middle. So you can see, and then they also have some numerical, uh, sorry, the monetary value of their sales, right? So think about this. If you are the director of a company, who will you want to give more bonus? Or who do you want to promote for the next level in their career? Or who you want to I don't know. So, so, so statistics are so useful because it helps you make decisions. Okay, let's have a little reflection, right? So we've talked about median and mode and uh, me, uh, mean, median, mode, and some box plots, some uh, quartile. Let's say you have this value, right? Mm, can you think of when is the best time that you want to use mean? In what situation that you only want to use mean rather than median amount? Think about it. Okay. So mean is actually very useful when, when your data do not have very extreme values. You don't, it doesn't have extremely high or extremely low values that are different from the rest of the data points, right? So when, when, when you have your data that is relatively clean without having a lot of extreme values on an extremely high, extremely low, then you can easily calculate mean. So, so this is for kind of a, for practical or pragmatic reasons, but also mean give you that number that allows you to know, well, on average, this is the value of this thing that I'm interested in. What about median? When do you use median? That, that, that will be something that uh, I want you to, to do and to ha have a look at. Uh, but for example, one of the most commonly used, uh, uh, practically used for median is when people are calculating income. And for example, for policymakers, for economists, they're very much interested in the distribution of income in the population, in the society, right? So when people talk about uh, talk about income, um, median is frequently used. Right? 
you can speculate why we don't use mean to portray income, why a lot of economists and uh, policymakers like to use median. You can think about it. Well, you know, mean value can be susceptible to a certain number of people or certain observations that have extremely, let's say not extremely high as outlier, but just within the range, but they are very, very high value. So when, for example, when people have, let's say from a population of 7 million people in a city, if you have, I don't know, 10,000 people who earn more than, let's say more than $5 million per year, that is very high. And you might have some people, might be a lot of people who earn less than, uh, I don't know, let's say less than uh, $100,000 per year, right? If you add them up and you calculate, add them up everyone's salary and you calculate the mean value, you might have some value that, 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 that doesn't quite make sense. And that's why it's a lot easier that you could use some median value in which you, you line up everyone's salary in a sequential order, right? From the lowest salary taker to the person who have highest salary in that population or society, and you take the, the guy in the middle, how much is this person's salary? And that exactly that the, the graph you show that you show in the uh, in, in, in a PowerPoint slides here. So it shows that actually, I think this is a real um, uh, median uh, value of income of different ethnic groups or racial groups in America, which shows that um, different ethnicity or race have different sort of level of income, right? Um, yeah, so 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 I mean, my purpose is not talking about any substantial substantial insights from data, but I just want you to to have a look in what way that you want to use median, in in, in what situation that you want to use mean, in what situation that you want to use a lot of mode. For example, when 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 you look at people's IQ in, in terms of distribution, you have some people who have IQ from what to what, and at what level to what level, you may add it up. And you might find that the mode or the most people, the mode, which is the most of the observation or most of the people would have a very average IQ, the one in the middle, the middle bar, right? So, so there are different circumstances and different usages for mean, median and mode. So I'm, I'm sure people are still debating about, you know, defining when is the best time to use one or the other. Now, the fourth type of commonly used uh, descriptive uh, statistics is called standard deviation. So standard deviation tells you how far is your data points, your observations is from the mean value. Remember, let's say you survey 100 people, right? You have every person is, is represented as a dot in the whatever that you're trying to, to understand. And you try to see how spread is your data of these people from the guy in, a, in the mean, in the average value. Let's say you conduct a survey. Uh, here, I, I'm using a very small, simple numbers in order to, to give you the, 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 the insights about what is standard deviation. So let's say you capture a survey called, you capture a survey in a survey, you capture a variable called E, variable E. And when you variable E, the first person give you score nine, second person give you score two, and the last person give you a score of 12. So when you do the uh, standard deviation, you can, you can calculate it by hand using the formula in the, in the circle there. So when you want to calculate the standard deviation, first you calculate the mean value. And you know how to calculate this. You add it up, add them up, divided by the total observation five times, so 6.4. And then you take the, you square them. You square each of the observation, which is, let's say the first one is nine, you minus that from your mean value, which is 6.4, you square that. And you go to the second observation, which is two. From the two, you minus that with the average or the mean value, which is 6.4, and you square that. And you add them up all along, that will give you 65.2. And then your standard deviation will be the square root of that 65.2 divided by five. Five is the observation, five times, right? or five people. So you get 
So you can do this calculation, or you can follow the steps shown in the in the PowerPoint. And you don't have to, basically, you don't have to do this calculation uh, manually because SPSS or R will provide this for you as long as you click it or use the instructions. And you can also calculate standard deviation using Excel. So Excel is very powerful these days. You can do anything. So, so this is standard deviation. But what do you want to know standard deviation? It tells you how varied your data is. For example, you may, you may be interested in um, the rain, right? Like how often it rains, how often it rains from the average rainy, rainy days in a year, right? And you have a number of cities that you want to, to go for holiday for, and you like to be in a dry weather. You don't want to be very wet when you're going for holiday, right? And when, when, when you know that a certain city as a target, target place where you want to go for, for holiday, let's say that standard deviation for the rain is very large, then you, you could make a conclusion that it's more highly likely to rain a lot, which you can't really predict when, compared to another city that has a, a, a lower standard deviation in which the range between uh, raining a lot and raining a little is not very large. So, so the standard deviation shows you how spread is your data. Now, variance is the twin brother or the twin sister of standard deviation, very similar. The only difference that is, is that in variance, you don't have that square root, right? Remember in the previous standard deviation, there's a square root there. So standard deviation is a square value of the standard deviation. So if standard deviation has a square root formula for variance, you take it out or you just apply the square value to the standard deviation, then you get just a normal variance, right? So variance is also tells you how far is your data spreading out from the mean value, right? So let's say you conducted a survey, you collect a variable called E and you have this value, right? Nine, two, five, four, 12, right? You calculate first the mean value, you add them up divided by five times, five occurrence of this observation, which gives you 6.4. And again, you take each observation minus the, the mean value, which is 6.4. So nine minus 6.4, you square it. And, and then the second one, two minus 6.4, square it until the last one. Sorry, the last one should be 12. 12 minus, 12 minus 6.4, I wrote four, but I'm sorry. So you, 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 you make, that, uh, make that calculation, it will give you the total number of 65.2, and you divide it by five, and they'll give you 13.4. So variance is 13.4. So again, Variance and standard deviation are something that is produced for you in the statistical packages. Now, correlation is also a very useful, uh, perhaps the most useful type of descriptive statistics. It gives you uh, a picture or an understanding of the linear relationship between two variables or more than two variables. Because if you have a, a table that have multiple variables, then you can see the relationship between more than two variables, right? For example, the relationship between creativity and performance or the temperature with ice cream sales in the beach, things like that. So correlation is so powerful because it is the basis of regression. In, in, in fact, the technique used to calculate the parameters for regression is built upon correlation. You can always, you can only use correlation if your data is measured in metric or ratio scale and interval scale. If you have nominal, you can't do it. Or categorical, you can't do it. Or ordinal, you don't do it. It's only for metric and interval scale. And coefficient correlation, partly we talked about this from last week, right? So it has a minimum to a maximum value from zero to one. One means perfect correlation, zero means no correlation. And you also need to pay attention to the statistical significance of the relationship, of the correlation. Some of them, is significant, some of them may not be significant. And you need to look at the p-value or the significance, right? And 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 the, the correlation formula that people mostly use is called Pearson correlation. So this is named after the statistician who came up with uh, the formula 
to, to do this calculation. Think about how clever this person is when they can think of this very beautiful mathematical formula to calculate correlation. And if you are the first one to, to discover this, then voila, people will remember you and put your name into some uh, statistical uh, analysis of functions and people will remember you forever. You can also calculate it by using Excel. So correlation is actually the first step that researchers use for hypothesis testing. Remember from the previous week, week one and week two, we talked about null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. Null hypothesis is written H0. An alternative hypothesis is hypothesis that have number hypothesis, one hypothesis, two hypothesis, three. Right? So when you say about correlation, Let's say you say variable one is associated with variable two. That is your alternative hypothesis, which you call H1, hypothesis one, right? And the null hypothesis, hypothesis for that is the one on the top, which says variable one is not associated with variable two or has no relationship with variable two. So in hypothesis, you're always interested in, in saying that there is a relationship among this thing that you are trying to measure. But the null hypothesis is always say there is no relationship or they have nothing to do. So, so because your interest in the research, you want to, to find out whether there is a relationship, your hypothesis should be, I'm hypothesizing or I'm theorizing that there is a relationship or there is an association between these two variables or these two things that I'm trying to study or measure. Right. An example, we can use entrepreneur orientation, you know, how you know business leaders. Uh, taking risks, uh, being uh, innovative and uh, aggressive and, and, and things like that, right? So that is uh, the element of all the dimensions of entrepreneurial orientation. So when you're hypothesizing, let's say, let's say you, no one has done this research, right? And you are the first one who say, I want to know whether entrepreneur orientation is associated with performance or not. So you can do that analysis and your hypothesis can be said, my H1, my alter, alternative hypothesis, entrepreneur orientation is associated with performance of the company. So the null hypothesis is the one at the top, which is saying entrepreneur orientation is not associated or has no relationship with performance. So if you collect data and then you test them using correlation and then regression and other means, and you found a support statistically, as indicated later by the correlation, by the beta value of the regression, which we're going to look at uh, the following week, and with a p-value to ascertain whether they are statistically significant or not, then you can make a claim that you support or not support your hypothesis, your alternative hypothesis in particular, right? So if this is supported, if H1 is supported, then you say, well, my data support this hypothesis or this alternative hypothesis that says entrepreneur orientation is associated or has relationship with performance. Okay, so correlations, we talked about it a little bit last week. So there are different types of correlations. The one that I want you to pay attention is the one at the corner top. Right? So that is when your data is everywhere. So you measure something on the X, so that's your variable. And on the, on the Y axis, that is the dependent variable, something that you're trying to plot that depend, uh, independent on the dependent variable, right? So, so every, every little, uh, you know, these circles are the data points, which represents humans or animals that you're measuring or companies or societies or households that you're trying to measure. Look at, look at that circles, the dots. The dots there is like everywhere, right? The one on the top left corner. The 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 the, the square uh, the uh, the circles are everywhere and you can't really see a pattern, right? Well, look at the one on the bottom right corner, my right corner, right? Look at that. They show a very clear pattern. Actually, you can take a line there. So that correlation show you is a correlation of zero point nine. So you can say you can see that that variable a and the y axis, which is called variable b, is very much. Uh, correlated so that so that every increase of A is accompanied by an increase in B. Any increase in A, increase by in B. So look at that. So the higher A, you have also the higher B. So that, that becomes like that, diagonally going up. But you can have also correlation 
let's say the one at the top left there, which is which has a correlation of 0 0.1. Look at the circles, it's everywhere. So you don't have a clear pattern. Is it going up or down or left or right? You don't know, you can't see. So Pearson correlation, the one you, you look at how big they are, which tells you the closer to one, the more the more the stronger the relationship between the two variables that you are measuring, the one on the X and the one on the Y. So if they are perfectly, if they're perfectly correlated, they have a value of one, which, which means that one unit increase of variable A is accompanied by one unit increase of B. Three, three unit of increase of A is, in, is followed by three unit of increase of B. So, so that's how it sort of works, right? But you also have correlations at different, at the different patterns and some are going to the left. Now look at the one next to uh, the, the, the middle at the bottom, correlation at minus 0 0.8. It's very similar to that, the one 0 0.9, but it's going to the other side. So it's also very strong correlation that is going to the, to the other side, which means that there's a negative relationship. There's negative relationship between a, variable A on the X and the variable Y on the, uh, variable, uh, variable B on the Y, which means that the higher A, the lower B, the higher A, the lower B. So that's why it looks at it. So hopefully that's useful. Again, this is very similar and you may also have no correlation like the one, the one on the top, uh, you know, the top right, my right, right? It just have one straight line because the blue dots, the, the blue dots are the observations. Let's say each person that you are measuring or each animal, if you are researching an animal or, or each organization that you are studying, so you can see that it's just everywhere and there's no clear pattern, no relationship, 0 0.024 for the Pearson correlation. You may also have non-linear correlation. Remember we talk about non-linear uh, graph or non-linear correlation, curvilinear and different type of uh, linears. It can go this way, it can go this way. So, so, so there are many different types of correlation. So for example, this is minus, but it's minus 0 0.022. So it looks this way. So at one point it will, the bigger the X, the Y will get smaller. And at some point at a maximum, the, the bigger the X value, the Y value will go up again. So it goes down and go up. Think of it, in what circumstances you have something like that? Unlike this one, right? When you have something that looks looks like end, like a letter N. You can think of some people give example like eating medicine. When people don't eat medicine when they're sick, you know, their health performance is not very good. And when you take medicine, you perform, your health performance is getting better. But up to a point when you eat too much medicine, your health may even deteriorate because the, the, the medicine becomes a poison in your body. But, that way. but think about what kind of real life phenomena can be explained using this uh, U type of, 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 of functions. Think about it. Uh, this is another example of a correlation table that is typically spit out by SPSS. So you have like one, two, three, four, five. You have five variables and uh, SPSS will give you a correlation table. So five here and the same five here. So that's why you have a diagonal value there. Diagonal value have one, 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 one. What, what does it, why does it give you one? Does anybody know? Why does, it give, why does it give you one, one, one at the diagonal? Very good. Because that one, one, one is always the correlation of the same variable on itself. Look at that, the Weschel IQ test score and the Weschel. What is the relation between the same thing? It must be one. What is the relation between depression score and depression score? It must be one. But what you're interested in is the relationship of unique variables, the variables that are not itself, right? Let's say the, the, uh, the correlation between anxiety tests or depression tests or the general well being tests and the social function, functioning tests. So the trick to this is either you read the one diagonal down or diagonal up. I'll tend to use the diagonal down, the one at the bottom, because it's kind of like easier on the eyes to see. And I'll just ignore the diagonal value, right? This could be a little exercise that you could do. You can think of which variables have negative correlations with each other? And are the correlations statistically significant? And you need to pay attention also to the sample size. 
that is associated with that correlation because it depends on when the data is not perfect, some, there are some missing values and the researcher may need to remove uh, a certain observation or certain individuals from the study or they want, uh, it's called the, the, the least wise or they may have a pay wise in which they remove uh, just that variable for a particular person that is missing. So, so it depends on how, so that's why you can see that the N number is not always the same. The sample size is not the same. For example, uh, look at the look at the anxiety test score. The columns is the anxiety test score. It has an N of 113, right? While the others are 117. And also look at the first column on the, on the, on the first row. <clears throat> uh, sorry, the second row. First column, West Shell IQ and depression test score. It has an N of 116. So there are 116 people in that sample. So that's depend on how the researcher clean up uh, the missing data. Uh, and this is the typical type of SPSS output uh, in terms of correlation. So it gives you this kind of number. In the same way, you can uh, practice yourself in terms of quickly spotting uh, and, and finding a way to make a conclusion from a correlation table in terms of which variables are created with other variables and what is the direction. Is it positive or negative? Is the, is the correlation, Pearson correlation value very high or very low or medium? And what is the p-value or statistical significance of that correlations? So those are the things that you will pay attention. Now, chi-square. Chi-square is another very, uh, very useful type of descriptive statistics. Though not many people talk about what it is, in, in my personal view, I look at chi-square as a very similar thing with correlation, except that for chi-square, you use it to look at the relationship or independence of variables that are measured in nominal or categorical variables. Remember, to use correlation, your variables must be in metric or interval scale. You have a precise number or very precise steps that you can calculate the correlation. But when your data is not of that type, when let's say your data is about gender, male, female, binary, or non mentioned or your your data is uh, religious belief. What is your religious belief? You know, uh, Islam, Buddhism, Christianity, Taoism, Confucianism, Judaism. These are different types or different categories or what we call nominal or categorical variables. When you have variables like this, then using chi-square is more appropriate. Now, when you have very small chi-square statistics, it means that you observe data and expected data uh, um, fits very well, right? When your chi-square statistics is very large, it means that the data does not fit with each other or there isn't a relationship. So chi-square is also useful hypothesis testing. Again, for hypothesis testing in which your variables are in nominal or categorical variables, in the same way as the example of the hypothesis testing that I told you earlier. So, so chi-square can be used to interpret whether variable one uh, is not independent from variable two. Right? So that is your high alternate, alternate, alternate hypothesis in which the now hypothesis is saying the variable one is independent of variable two. So your, your alternate hypothesis is saying it is not independent. When it's not independent, it means they are related, right? Or you say it's not associated. Variable one is not associated with variable two. That's the same as that it has no relationship. Or you say it's associated, variable one is associated with variable two. So that means there is a relationship. So, so that means in, a, in essence, the chi-square and correlation are very similar, except that the variables are measured in different, uh, the, the requirement for the type of scale is very different. For chi-square, you use chi-square because your, your variable has been measured using nominal or categorical scale. Can you calculate it by hand? Yes, of course, yes. So there's a mathematical formula there. So chi-square is the sum, sum is the sigma value of your observed value minus expected value, square them divided by expected value, right? Or chi-square is sigma of i to one, the first to the n of observed variable, variable of individual one 
minus the expected value of individual ones, square them and divide it by uh, the expected value of one. So let's let's use example. Let's use an example. You have observed count. You do a very quick, simple survey. Uh, how many people drink alcohol uh, last two, uh, in the last two hours? And you ask them whether they're male or female in terms of gender. So you can think of the gender as the IV, independent variable, male, female, and drinking alcohol in the last two hours as your dependent variable, yes and no. So again, your dependent variable is categorical, yes and no. Your independent variable gender is also categorical, male and female. Yeah, And you have 77 male who say yes and 16 who say no. Yeah, sorry, you have 77 male who say yes and 16 female who say yes. Sorry, and then you have 404 male who say no and 122 female who say no, right? And you can add up for yes and add up total for no and add up for total for male, add up total for female and the total. So the grand total is 619, 619. So how do you calculate the expected? So you need to have the observed count first. And then you go back to calculate the expected count. So in the expected count, how do you calculate it? You go to those who say yes. Yes is 93 from, look at the yellow one. The bottom, observe account, the total people is 93. So you take that 93 to the blue area, 93, right? You, multi you, you multiply that with what? Multiply that with 481. Where does 481 come from? All the male, all the male horizontal is 481. So 93 multiplied by 481 divided by the total grand people in the survey, 619. So 93 multiplied by 418 divided by 619. They give you 72.3. And you repeat the same for each cell. And then you enter them in a formula. You're going to get your chi-square in one number. Or you can also calculate this by Excel if you want to. Uh, this is just to give you some example. Let's say in your research, your research question is, is gender associated with their preference for learning medium? And in the survey, you have independent variable of gender, male, female, categorical variable. And the dependent variable called the pref preferred le learning medium, which you divide into whether they prefer to learn using books or online, right? So when you run your SPSS, if you have the data when you run your SPSS, when you check for chi-square, uh, it will give you chi-square test. And what, what, because it gives you a lot of, a lot of different estimates, the features and likelihood and contingent. But the one that we want to pay attention to is the Pearson chi-square. Right? So it gives you that value and the significance, those that are circling red. Right? So you can see here, you can make a conclusion from this study that we can see here that chi-square one to 80. So one is the, de the degrees of freedom. Look at the table, there's a chi-square, that is a DF degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom, we're going to talk about this in, in, in other time when we have when we have the time, but basically how it works is always the number of variables multiplied by one. So here we have two variables. One is gender, the other one is preferred learning. So two variables, so two minus one. So so that's why the degrees of freedom is one. So chi-square of one to 80. 80 is the total sample size, okay? 80 equals to 0 0.487, that comes from the pairs and chi-square at p-value of 0.485. Is that significant? Of course, it's not significant because the value is much larger than 0.05. Remember, our threshold value for social sciences is typically 0.05. We want our significant value or p-value to be lower than 0.05. A lot of medical science, because they want to be more stringent, because they're dealing with life and death of people's life. So they like to use 0 0.001 or 1%. So, so this suggests that there is uh, no statistically significant association between gender, gender and the learning, preferred learning medium. That is, both male and female equally prefer online learning versus books. Or you can also say, there is not enough evidence to suggest that there is a difference or there is an association between gender and the preferred learning medium. So if you're still not too sure, you can plot out the data using a bar chart. And you go to SPSS, there's a function there called, uh, for you to help you to, to plot your bar chart. 
And you just have a look at this, right? The green bar for male and the green bar for female, which is the online, is always higher than the blue one. The blue one is the, the books. So you can see both male, female uh, uh, like uh, online, but also look at the blue, the blue one, the learning by books, the male and the female. So you can, you can see that there is no very clear uh, patterns of relationship between uh, a certain gender and a certain learning medium. You would, you, you would see a very different bar chart if, for example, you find that a male likes to learn a lot more using online rather than books, then the, the, the bar chart will look very different. Right? The bar chart will be very different. So I'll, I'll leave it up to there. Let's look at another example here. So for example, is eating associated with religion? So this researcher uh, have an independent variable of eating. So they measure people in terms of whether you are a meat eater or vegetarian and they measure the religion. They use a very simple, whether you, are, you have no religion or whether you are Christian. So you can interpret this. I'll let you interpret this, what this really means. But quickly, in a sense, uh, this, is, this is saying that um, uh, religion does have look at look at the look at the person chi square six point seven one eight, and the significance is zero point zero one. So it means that there is a significant relationship between eating a certain type of food with religious values. And here, if we have a look, just look at the count. You can quickly see that for the meat eater, yeah, for the non-religion, they have a count of five from an expected count of eight point five. So the actual count is so much smaller than expected count, right? Look at the Christian one, the meat eater. The expected count is only seven point five. The but the actual meat eater among the Christian sample in the study is eleven, so it's much bigger than the expected count. Right, and also compared to five and eleven, the Christian eat more meat than non-religion. And look at the look at the vegetarian; it's the reverse pattern. Look at look at it. Um, in the vegetarian one, the expected count for people who are who eat vegetarian with no religion is the expected count is seven point five. But for those who have no religion, they there are eleven people who are vegetarian, so higher. The count is higher than the expected count. Right, 11 versus 7.5. Look at the Christian one. You expect 6.5 uh, expected number of people who are vegetarian and Christian. But in fact, the Christian who are vegetarian are only three. So the actual count, three, is smaller than the expected count, which is 6.5. So here you can see quickly that uh, for the meat eater group, there are a lot more Christian then they're more likely to be Christian. And for the vegetarian one, um, there is less likely the Christian to be vegetarian, but no religion are more likely to be, more likely to be vegetarian. So here you can also see, just from this without looking at the, the chi-square statistics, you can also see that there is a relationship in which people who are Christian tend to eat more meat than those who are vegetarian. I don't know why, but if you check people who are, which I did, like asking some friends who are Christian. Actually, in the Christian Christianity, there is no uh, particular dietary requirements. In, in certain religion like Judaism or Islam or Buddhism, there's a certain strict dietary requirements that people need to follow, whether you're vegetarian or you shouldn't eat a certain type of meat, a certain type of uh, food, and things like that. Now, this is another example. Is marital status associated with education? Right, so here you have a, uh, a marital status, never married, married, divorced, and widowed, plotted against their degree, their education. Right, middle, lower school, high school, bachelor, master's, PhD, or higher, and you have a total number. In the same way, in the same way, you can do the calculation and it can come up with the with the value, and you run it on SPSS to do chi, chi square test, and it gives you the Pearson chi square uh, value and the significance. So again, you can interpret this in terms of you have a person chi square of 23.567 and it is statistically significant. Some, some people have created some nice tables to allow us to look at uh, like with degree, different degrees of freedom in terms of variables that you're using in a study and the level of significance of alpha. 
where where should that threshold be? Right. For example, in our study, in a lot of social sciences, we use zero point zero five. So, um, the 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 chi square, the chi square will look in this sort of format. So this somehow will give you a very quick uh, take in terms of understanding uh, whether your study uh, makes sense or not, whether it is produced a certain chi-square distribution that is uh, uh, sort of up in, in accordance uh, with this table or not. This is another example to, you know, to show you different meanings or different labels of, of um, a measurement. For example, we have nominal and ordinal and interval and ratio scale. In SPSS, there's a term called scale. Scale applies to interval and ratio scale. While for nominal and ordinal, it's the same as ordinal and nominal. But for interval and ratio, SPSS will just call it scale. Okay, I'll stop it there for the time being and I'm gonna go to the next uh, video, uh, the, the, the part two on statistical procedures. Thank you, bye.